Here goes my check-in. I've signed an order tonight that will do the following. Restaurants will be closed for dining inside those restaurants. Until that date that they actually said, all right, restaurants are no longer allowed to operate. It was this big game of cat and mouse. It was like this panicked energy. You could feel like there was no guidance. We were just watching the news. Like, there was nobody that had insider information on what was happening. People are just thinking, oh, Chinese restaurants, oh, COVID-19. So Chinese restaurants equal danger. That Sunday is when we hear of a mandatory stay at home. Like Monday the 16th was when everything was gone. We're like the hustlers slash survivors. <laughs> this is going to be the time in history that we talk about. What did we do in this pandemic? I'm gonna take you on a tour and then you can talk to Ashley a little bit. And then uh, there's that one. I like this one a lot. And there's this one right here. I'll frame all these when we're done. It's just chaos. Fucking everything, everywhere. And then these are all boxes we're building. This is our produce from today. So this is the command center. I'm going downstairs. Oh yeah, she's going down to the cellar. I'm gonna take the elevator. Oh yeah, good idea. We actually always talked about doing something together even before we were a couple. I know. And it was just like talk of like how we could do it better because we had done it for so many people and we wanted to be able to not say no to the people who wanted to have an experience. Making sure we accommodated people and not being so rigid I think there's like too much of that in restaurants. All right, I'll turn you over to Lee here. You got it, cool. We are sort of trying to do what we've always done, which is just show up for what the need is. And right now the need is being a grocery store. I got your food right here. We'll get your drinks in just a second. Do you need utensils? The changes no. we've made are not small. Like we are a completely different business now. Yeah, we're we're grocery delivery business that sells some hot food. You know, we do our own deliveries, you know, taking stuff from farmers and bringing them straight to people because the markets are terrifying. There's no way we could stay open on hot prepared food. No chance. Just drop your ass into it. There you go. That was good time. Yeah, that was perfect. There she is. You know, I have more experience smoking briskets than anyone here, so I'm just gonna sit in this chair for the next 10 hours and do that. Starting today, restaurants may reopen and occupancy will be limited to 60%. 10 minutes ago, the government said we could open. Our furniture's in storage, but that shouldn't be a problem. We have high chairs. We can do four top of babies. Yes. Welcome in. There's two of y'all? Yes. Great. Our furniture is in storage, but I think you'll be comfortable. Yeah, with some more masks. Okay. I'm not sure. We just found out 10 minutes ago. So no, we're not opening. I think it's insanely reckless and I think it encourages, you know, it encourages restaurants to do the absolute minimum to scramble for their lives. You couldn't have said, hey, in two days, hey, a week from Friday. It's just that feeling of like not being supported, you know, by the government, not being able to really do anything. There's no game plan. Now, oh, I guess we'll open as a restaurant, but, oh, 60% capacity, thanks. I'll pay 60% of my bills. Then what happens? We're gonna close again? I mean, you're just getting dicked around with no leadership. We're not going to open a restaurant where we serve you with the mask and gloves on. Like, that's not what this restaurant is or ever will be. I don't know. Sorry, I'm just listening to someone do dumb shit. We're definitely not growing. We're not building a bank account. I mean, it is scary. I mean, because it's our personal money. You know, it's not like we don't have an investor. We don't have a backer. I want a hot dog or a Everyone's fucked. You know? But other than that, I'm excited.
Oh, we actually, uh... We have a wine club. Yeah, what the f***? We employ over 11 million workers across the nation. The industry generates a trillion dollars in revenue per year, and we comprise 4% of the nation's gross domestic product. A restaurant's a real simple mathematical equation. The average check price times by the amount of covers you do. So as soon as you limit that, the truth is the money dries up and there's no money in the account to pay your staff. It's very difficult to try and figure out what the right thing to do is and how to keep your team. We're gonna lose a lot of restaurants in America and the culinary industry will never be the same. If we don't get the proper support that we need, they won't be able to survive. Well, it's April 16th, one month exactly since I was at 232 Bleecker and um, heading back into the city for the first time. We're a creative restaurant where we wanted to change the menu, focus on local vegetables and ingredients. We had been open uh, almost three months. We're not a big operation, and so a lot of places that do takeout, um, you know, are set up for this. We were trying to like take some takeout orders on the phone. You know, we didn't even have like an app or anything set up, and we kind of like weighed everything and and thought like for our business right now, the best thing to do is to close. You know, I was always taught growing up to help your neighbors and looked after people. And the heart of what we're doing at 232 Bleecker is working with farmers that we know. I'm very close with Dade from Norwich. A lot of my team have been helping him out at the market. We, we love it when a customer can walk up and they're actually talking to a chef. It's different than, you know, our normal crew. They're lovely people. We love them, but they don't usually eat this stuff. They're not cooks. Those guys, a lot of those folks up front are, are cooks and chefs. So, you know, it's a whole different experience, and hopefully our, our customers are taking advantage of it. You know, we've been fighting so much for restaurants, but we can't do that without those that support us, like the farmers. Over the past year, there's been light brought to like all the farmer suicides. And I'm trying to connect with the farmers and see how they're feeling because, you know, when I talked to them two weeks ago, it could be a very different feeling than what's going on this week. I decided to walk to 232 Bleecker today. It's about four and a half miles. Um, just didn't want to take the train and it's pretty empty out here. I'm on the Manhattan Bridge. There's really no one in sight. Um, but yeah, going back to um, back to work today. See how it goes. It's funny because we just opened the restaurant. So a lot of our opening was like this. And so it, it kind of feels like we're going backwards. In New York City, you know, tables are close together. Everybody tries to pack everybody in to get the, the most use out of their spaces. Um, and in popular restaurants, you need all those tables to be able to, to meet the demand. So we've got like some workers on the floor um, and generally where we would have tables for people to sit, we're gonna have um, kind of a retail and provision section. So you'll be able to buy pastries and breads and things. Um, I think it's less of a pivot, more of like, you know, that game when you put your head down on the baseball bat and you turn around in circles until you fall over. I think that's kind of what everybody's experiencing. This time period might have taught people that they actually can be self-sufficient and they can do things. Um, and hopefully it doesn't mean that no one will want to ever go out to eat. But, you know, I would be happy if people said like, hey, tonight, instead of ordering in, I'm going to just like cook myself something healthy. It's hard and I feel like I'm just like seeing months of my life, you know, kind of like in the future go by. I'm turning 40 this summer, so. What does that mean in terms of career? Am I where I wanted to be? I don't know. I hope um, New York restaurants and restaurants all over the country will go back to what they're known for. Um, places to gather and places to be taken care of and find great food and wine. And, you know,
So the restaurant industry really encompasses all different kinds of people. So I think it's important to talk about the diversity of jobs that we create as well as the connection that we have to purveyors. The wine people, the purveyors, the growers, the effect is so vast in our industry that it's, it's frightening. We all need each other. And we all connected to every human out there. We connected to our farmers, we connected to the mom and pop down the street. We have become a world that is reactive, not pro proactive. Hold on, baby, can I speak on the phone? Can I speak on the phone? This isn't a restaurant industry problem. This is a national problem. Hmm? Hello, little guy. Can you say hello? Um, I think this is the week four range. Um, so you can see from that little tiny baby, they're actually quite a substantial duck already. Hi, bye. Say hi. My dad and mom actually started the business together. I grew up in slow food. Like my dad was always a leader in our local convivium. Um, and so it was like, ideas and mantras had been like hammered into my head for so long. I guess I really growing up didn't quite appreciate what Sonoma County means and what it is and the, the culture that it is. And I think people appreciate food in a way that you don't see in the United States as often as you would maybe in Italy or France or Spain. And I traveled really far to work in those communities to realize that I grew up in it. <laughs> so today is Tuesday, which means we get our day old hatchlings. Say hi, babies. There's no farmer who can like put a pause on their crops growing or their animals being raised. <laughs> These guys saw me come in. You know, we are so intertwined with the restaurant industry. Like whatever happens to them is gonna affect us no matter what. I don't know if it was like the realization that things aren't going to get back to normal anytime soon, um, but we started to get a lot more letters from restaurants being like, we know we owe you money. Please be patient with us. We use these bell waters so that the ducks kind of emulate what they would do if they were out in a pond. So the wholesale in two weeks went from normal amount down 80%. We had never done retail before, so trying to launch that at the same time just to keep any sort of dollar bills coming in and out, um, it was really overwhelming. But without restaurants, it'll never go back up because there's only so much that consumers will consume. <sighs> Every night I'm waking up for a while in the middle of the night, just like stressed about something. Um, and it's pretty cool. We've got everything organized. <laughs> so that we can keep track of all of our products. Um, we've got the half breast or half legs that we're doing now. Normally prior to this, we were doing 12 in a bag, but we're doing six for home consumers. My dad is 65, and, or 64, he would be mad if I said 65. Uh, every time, um, I'll get choked up if I talk about it too, but every time he's like, Without you, we, we wouldn't have the business. And he starts like tearing up and he's just like, you're, you're keeping it going. And he, then he turns around and he walks out of the room. There is so little support offered by the government and by the state and by the city to be able to really uplift businesses and provide them with help and the resources that they need. You know, there's a reason why the airline industry will get bailout money and we won't because we're not a unified group. We're hundreds of thousands of independent people all doing our own thing. So when you're talking about governmental aid for small businesses, yeah, that's great if you have hair salon with five employees and, and not perishable goods. But 
What we need in, 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 in government aid is somebody that knows the restaurant business intimately that can translate that information in our business models so we get the aid that's necessary. Our workers are going to be the ones that are left in the worst place if they're not protected. We need to redistribute the support to, to the folks who have been the most exploited, right? People who have been the backbone of this industry. Don't forget about all those immigrants that's helping us right now. Do not forget that. Eyes weren't open to it before. I hope they are now to who's the most vulnerable in our community. The government, you know, we elected you, so take care of your people. You can put them on the on the foot. Lots of me start to come up talking about how their staff has no money. But one thing that we start to notice is it's like bartenders speaking on behalf of bartenders, waiters speaking on behalf of waiters. Whole restaurants that are using photos of very white staff members, we see nothing in Spanish. And we start to think like, what the fuck is going on here? So we immediately know that helping undocumented workers is where our calling is. It's safe to say that 80% of restaurants in Los Angeles employ at least one individual that's undocumented. It's not just hospitality pops, it's, it's full on spectrum. How can we provide for these folks and keep them fed? We can feed a family of four for $33 for seven days. What up? We just, so we just unloaded one, two, three, four pallets right now of food. There is a good amount here and we like to Come on show down. all of our donors and our friends all the stuff that's coming in. It smells amazing, by the way. What does it smell like? Tell us. It smells like fresh bread, baby. Like seeing what the tortilla chip. Within 24 hours, we had enough money to help 60 families. 24 hours later, we had enough to help 120 families. And then it didn't stop. It didn't stop. We're talking life and death here, man. We're talking individuals that haven't eaten for weeks and in some cases, fucking months. I'm talking scoops of peanut butter and water. And, I'm, and not just individuals, but families and kids. And how do you how do you explain to your, your kid, your daughter, your son? I don't know where I'm gonna feed you. I don't know where that's gonna come from. We wouldn't be here unless it was for everyone that's donating. I think we should take a look. So today, Sunday, May 17th, Los Angeles Times. No jobs, no papers, no benefits. And then you got Tony right there. Well, and that's the interesting part is that they don't want to give you a work permit because you're illegal, but they give you an I-10 so you can pay taxes, which is a tax identification number. There's no support for Tony, but there was fucking a clear fucking path to Tony to pay his fucking money. You know, I try to hustle and, and make whatever whatever money I could. At least I became a server, you know? At least I got the opportunity. A little brown kid, a little Oaxacan kid as a server. And, and it's our duty as, like, I feel as a, as a hospitality professional to just provide that warmth to people and make it feel inviting and welcome. I've had plenty of college kids that left that one last bus tub or didn't scrub the dish pit or didn't fucking mop the floors before they left. My Tonys, they've never done that. You know, look guys, like, I understand that Americans need jobs. Guess what? They aren't showing up for these jobs. Who's gonna go wash dishes? Who's gonna pick vegetables? It isn't my skin color and the fact that I'm undocumented that took the job. It's the fact that I could probably cook a little better than the next person. Or the fact that maybe in the kitchen, you just can't hack it. If they're gonna let immigrants come into this country to pick fucking lettuce, either make them citizens, you know, you can't just have people be deemed essential and take advantage of them. It's just, it's not socially acceptable, you know? <sighs> Stresses me out, dude. Hola, muchas gracias.
mucho gusto. Me llamo Damián Díaz. Estoy llamándole de la organización No As Without You. Recibí su información aquí vía correo electrónico de un cuestionario que llenó. No As Without You, I, I think it's a great long term thing. I, I don't think that undocumented people are ever going to be like so well fed that they're not going to need, you know, food security. I, I don't, I don't envision, I would love it. I would love it tomorrow. You know, the government passed a bill that made them all citizens, but I, I doubt that's going to happen. So, if we can still keep working to feed people, then I'm, I'm more than happy doing this all day, every day. We're not going anywhere. We're going to continue to provide support for our people until the fucking wheels fall off. We love you, LA. I love this fucking city, dude. It's my town. It's late, it's probably almost 11. Um, Tyler's gone to bed. We had a long day and then came home and put a roast in the oven and then it's still in there. So we ate cheese and drank some wine instead and listened to some records. We're not trying to think too far ahead in the future, but you know, I'm really tired, but that could be the wine for dinner with a small glass of cheese talking um and we'll get up and do it again tomorrow yeah that's it good night